Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast Solo Pod Edition. I'm your host, Ian Hart. It's here to break down all things at the quarterback position ahead of week two. As always, try to keep you solo pods more on the 15 to 30 minute side. Definitely will be close to 15 for the quarterback episode. Looking at the streamers of the week, some of the best matchups of the week, and get to the quarterback rankings. Plenty of fun sprinkled in. So thanks so much for tuning in. Let's get after it. First things first, the matchup to take advantage of this week. It's going to be Washington Commanders quarterback Carson Wentz at the Detroit Lions. Something we tried to stress on this podcast throughout the entire summer, and now here we are now still talking about it. Wentz, well, no, he, I don't think he's ever going to be quite as good as he was in 2017. I don't think anyone's going to confuse him as a potential MVP candidate again. The disparity between him and the rest of the league's average to below average QBs maybe was a bit overstated this offseason, especially considering all the weapons that he's got available in this Washington offense. So coming off a top five finish in week one, now gets a Detroit Lions defense in the dome, like coming into the year, 25th ranked secondary, 26th ranked offensive line. They just ranked 31st in week one in EPA allowed per play. Fair play to the Jalen Hurts and the Eagles. Maybe we just haven't seen, you know, the true version of this Dan Campbell defense yet. But again, with Carson Wentz back there, if you need a streamer, if you're trying to replace Dak Prescott, I think Wentz is your best bet right now. So without Wentz, I would say Justin Fields and Jameis Winston are your next two best bets. If you're out of that waiver wire, don't be afraid to go listen to the also Tuesday edition of this podcast, myself and Nathan Yankee going through the full waiver wire list. One matchup we got to be cautious of, Baltimore Ravens quarterback Lamar Jackson against the Miami Dolphins. You got to start Lamar. I, I wrote this article, I did my ranks, and I still rank Lamar QB6. So this is not a fade Lamar thing. But in that QB1 tier, I have moved Lamar to the bottom of it because he just hasn't been good against the Blitz over the past two seasons. And we can always go back to 2019 when Lamar was incredible and everything. But guys, it's rough. PFF passing grade over the last two years, 34th among 39 qualified quarterbacks against the Blitz. His uh, yards per attempt, 25th. His adjusted completion rate, 21st. His QB rating, 30th. Again, I'm not just sticking to the PFF grades. Every single stat you want to pull up looking at Lamar's performance against the Blitz, he is either average at best or more likely pretty damn bad, actually. So we saw this really come to fruition last year in this matchup against the Dolphins when they zero blitzed him seemingly every other snap. So in that game, 238 passing yards one touchdown he did chip in 39 rushing yards i don't know guys like this is a situation now where the dolphins have blitzed more than any other defense since week one of last season and look they were at 44 percent overall from week one to week one this year 48.5 percent blitz rate in week one that was the sixth highest mark so i think they're going to be coming after lamar early and often once again if they don't have that run game to slow that down just a little bit or they don't have that deep ball to make them respect it could be another long afternoon for lamar jackson but again please for the love of god don't even think about benching lamar we're not trying to lose money here bowl call of the week i missed last week on the trey lance overall qb1 call we certainly got off that a little bit more as we got closer to sunday and it was apparent just how bad the weather is but guess what we're back. Trey Lance, top five performance this week. That's what we're going with. I'm not getting afraid of Trey Lance just because of one bad performance in a freaking monsoon, just like you shouldn't really fault Justin Fields for that. And I think we did see guys like, you know, I think it was Austin Gale over at the ringer, maybe Ben Solik too, showing off that Trey Lance, he really did have a couple really nice throws. That deep crosser to Brandon Ayuk, the deep ball to Juwan Jennings down the sideline. A lot of bad throws, too. That interception he threw, what, late third, early fourth, inexcusable. I get it, but we saw the arm talent there. And more importantly, for fantasy purposes, the reason we care about Trey Lance in the first place, those rush attempts are still there. So he now has 44 rush attempts and four career extended appearances. That's good for a 17-game pace of 187 rush attempts. Lamar Jackson is the only quarterback in NFL history to clear 150 rush attempts in the season. I'm going back to well with Trey Lance. He's my QB7 on the week. Don't be afraid to trust him against the Seattle defense. Come and off, you know, again, such an emotional win. Short week, though, and I'm still not convinced that that front seven is going to be able to slow them down without Bobby Wagner around mentioned before streamer of the week going to be Carson Wentz shout out Jameis Winston last week streamer of the week for the QB nine performance appreciate you Jameis streamer of next week probably last week we were thinking it was going to be Jared Goff against Washington still not the worst but the way Washington's offense looked more than reasonable just to give Carson that nod but the streamer of week three who I'm trying to guess ahead of time I do think could be Atlanta Falcons quarterback Marcus Mariota so a lot of the week three matchups are tough I mean I was getting down to the bottom of it but let's just keep 
keep betting on quarterbacks playing the Seahawks if at all possible. I know they did a good job against Russ, but come on, we take away Jamal Adams now from the equation seemingly for the entire year. I'm just not so sure Seattle is going to be able to slow down these two Russian quarterbacks they got up next. And Mariota really has been a Russian quarterback lately. I saw him at Oregon. I understand that he ran a 4-5-2. The guy's athletic. Guys, he only surpassed 65 rushing yards one time in 63 games with the Titans. He's done it in each of his last two extended appearances now. Week one with the Falcons in that game a couple years ago where he came in after Derek Carr got hurt early on. So with Marcus Mariota, man, it's he's had 72 yards and a touchdown, 88 yards and a touchdown on the ground in these last two starts. The Falcons look like they were embracing it. Hey, it's not illegal for a bad real-life quarterback to put up some solid fantasy numbers. Marcus Mariota could be right there with Justin Fields in terms of those you know dual threat quarterbacks in bad offenses that we still like in fantasy land. Don't be afraid if you need a quarterback in week three, which I don't see a huge reason why you would. You know, I, know, I know we don't have bye weeks yet. Someone gets injured, though, or if you just had Dak and now you're looking at a situation where you're going week to week, Marcus Mariota setting up very nicely for a week three. Quarterback who in week one had to deal with the most sheesh. It's got to be Indianapolis Colts, Matt Ryan. Honorable mention Aaron Rodgers for that pearl of a deep ball to Christian Watson that got dropped on the first play of the game. But Matty Ice, otherwise not one, but two drop touchdowns that hit his receivers just straight up in the chest in the end zone. So Alec Pierce missed the first one. Ashton Duel in the second one, a little more excusable because he got punched out, but still. And I mean, I get it. Not completely you know removing matt ryan to blame here you get peyton manning comps throughout the entire offseason probably shouldn't be tying against the texans in week one but matt ryan really was a lot better i think than the box score gave him credit for so check out my week one sheesh report uh, for all those kind of beyond the box score notes that you can only really find by hashtag watching the film major riser of the week seattle seahawks quarterback geno smith the Geno game, guys, on Monday night, that was electric, that first half start. Even as a Drew Locke apologist, how can I be anything but happy for Geno Smith? I mean, Drew Locke lost a quarterback battle to the best quarterback alive. Like, no harm in that. But all uh, all sad jokes aside, I mean, Geno Smith, 23 of 28, 195 yards, pair of touchdowns. No, I'm not saying to stream Geno this week, even if you're in it. Probably not even if you're in a 2QB super flex league. It is manageable there. But hey, this is Geno Smith now. Another game where he played objectively really good football. Like how many times does this have to happen until we look at Geno Smith and he's no longer perceived as Geno freaking Smith. So, you know, it's just the same thing. I saw Rex Ryan went on, a, I think it was Pat McAfee's show, and he was just making fun of Geno's jaw for what, getting his jaw broke, you know, eight years ago or something like that. Like that jet stink is still following Geno around everywhere. And hey, if you just look at the last six games he's played with Seattle, it's been a lot of good things out there. So a lot of tight end usage in this one. Hopefully we get DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett balling soon. But hey, guys, at some point, if Geno Smith keeps doing this and we see a situation where the Seahawks aren't able to play with a lead in the same way they were uh, Monday night, Geno Smith, all of a sudden, I don't want to completely ignore the guy when if we did just take away his name, we looked at his underlying metrics compared to all these other quarterbacks, we'd be a lot more interested. So is Geno really that much more gross than someone like Jared Goff or like Carson Wentz when you're streaming him? I don't think so. We'll see what's in store for Geno the rest of the way. The major follower of the week, it's got to be Dak Prescott. Now, Jerry Jones is saying it's only going to be four weeks, potentially. Got to love uh, Jerry trying to, you know, put put out his best, put his best foot forward. But supposedly six to eight weeks from actual medical professionals. But the Cowboys aren't going to put him on IR, so we'll see. I'm just worried, guys. Like, we saw Russ try to come back from the pinky last year. Maybe it was his ring finger. Whatever it was, and he was rehabbing it for 18 hours a day, allegedly, or whatever that uh, storyline was. And he came back, and it took him several weeks to even look close to Russ again. I mean, Dak didn't even look like Dak in week one. So who's to say that after literally fracturing his throwing thumb that he's going to be back to normal anytime soon? Yeah, not good. With Dak, if you haven't, I guess – he should be able to go into an IR spot in most, most leagues. I wouldn't consider him someone you absolutely need to hold on to throughout this entire stretch, though. If you need to stream a quarterback, go ahead and stream a quarterback. Don't compromise like the opportunity to get like a legit RB1 or an upside wide receiver on the waiver wire over the course of what could, again, be two months for a quarterback that, when he gets back, I mean, low-end QB1, that's probably what we're hoping for at this point out of Dak. Sad, sad, sad start to the season for Cowboys fans. 
I want to shout out the movement in Miami going on. I love when I'm rewatching the games and I usually just take notes about questions I want to ask later and hopefully try to find some stats that show what I was seeing on the film. Novel concept uh, going on there and watching the Dolphins just really shocked throughout the whole game how much they were shifting and motioning before the snap. I looked it up afterwards and sure enough, number one in the week and shift motion rate before the snap was the Chiefs at 75.8%. Number two though, the Miami Dolphins at 74.6%. Bills in third place at 74.1%. So I fully understand the Chiefs and Bills were quite a bit more successful on offense than the Dolphins here, but it's just good to see Mike McDaniel bring that part of the Shanahan offense into Miami with Shanahan, LaFleur, and um, McVay. It's just tough sometimes to tell when their kind of disciples go to these new teams. We don't know how much of that offense was the offensive coordinator or how much of it was the head coach who's actually the one calling the plays. So last year, the 49ers easily number one in this shift motion rate at 80.7%. Good to see the Dolphins again up to 75% after being at just 58%. Last season, really feeling good about Tyree Kill, a little bit lesser extent Jalen Waddle, and really uh, Chase Edmonds here moving forward. And it's not a slight on Tua, still not totally sold on Tua having enough fantasy friendly volume as both a rusher and you know passer just to really get up there in the fantasy leaderboard he's going to need an awful lot of efficiency to do it either way though it's still a nice sign that the dolphins were able to go out there and actually look like an explosive offense been a while since we could say that the y'all must have forgot award of the week it's patrick mahomes we were able to call this last week and it's patrick mahomes so like it's calling a good patrick mahomes uh game or the pat in the back probably not we'll go with one though so just putting in the historical context though it really is wild that how much we take mahomes for granted at this point i mean in nfl history guys games with 300 plus passing yards and five touchdowns number one is drew Brees with nine such games brady has eight peyton has seven dan marino has six and already in fifth place all time is patrick mahomes with five pure madness going a lot to Judas Schuster, but yeah this week Mahomes my overall QB2 just behind the king himself Josh Allen now looking at some quarterbacks that might be under pressure as always I'm taking the offensive lines pressure rate and basically adding to the defensive lines pressure rate so this kind of helps us see the overall I guess difference between the matchups because this is how we usually talk about matchups it's like oh this team's number one in this this defense is number 30 in this so it must be a good matchup for the offense by combining those then we can just kind of I think judge them a little bit better one versus the other but these are the five quarterbacks popping the most on this in a negative way they should be under the most pressure this week so geno smith at the 49ers only the vikings allow a higher pressure rate in week one now we got nick bosa who had all sorts of success against justin fields already last week not looking like a good uh, potential encore there for geno smith also got to worry about kyler murray at the raiders pressured at the league six highest rate in the cardinals blowout loss to the chiefs raiders are one of the six defenses to post a pressure rate of at least 40 percent in week one not looking too good for Kirk Cousins at the Eagles. 55% pressure rate for Kirk Cousins and the Vikings in week one. Thank God Justin Jefferson was able to do his thing. But man, Eagles, they weren't really that great on defense, obviously, in week one, giving up 35 points to the Lions. I wouldn't be surprised if we see them really start to look the part of a great defense now that they're not facing PFF's third-ranked offensive line going to the year. Also, Joe Flacco against the Browns not looking good, and Justin Fields at the Packers not looking good. Guys, Fields? Fun performance, like just the backyard football stuff he was doing out there. The underhand pitch to Montgomery, the throwback to Pettis. A lot of good things going on there, but 3.64 seconds from snap to throw for Justin Fields. Easily the highest mark in week one. Second place was Lamar Jackson at 3.3. So we do naturally see mobile quarterbacks have the higher time to throw because they're able to hold on to the ball longer. Guys like, you know, a Jimmy Garoppolo, Joe Flacco are just kind of getting sacked before they even have the opportunity to extend it. But that has kind of been the talking point about Fields even going back to his days at Ohio State. We'll see if it's going to be problematic this week against a Packers defense that was able to post a fourth highest pressure pressure rate in week one. Other side of the coin, these are five quarterbacks who should have all day to throw this week, just based on, again, the pressure rates being combined from both their offensive line and their defense. So Marcus Mariota against the Rams. Mariota only pressured on 5.4% of his dropbacks in week one, easily the best. That said, Josh Allen, he wasn't pressured at all against the Rams. That's why Mariota's popping in this. Credit to Josh Allen for having the week's fourth quickest release time. So not really expecting Aaron Donald and company to stay quiet for much longer. Matt Ryan, though, looking good against the Jaguars. That's more of a DFS stream that I would be interested in. Lamar Jackson versus the Dolphins, only because the Dolphins weren't able to get to Mac Jones much in week one. And that was mostly because Mac Jones had the uh, third quickest release time in week one. As we saw with the Patriots offense, wasn't exactly helping them out doing that strategy. 
strategy. So fully anticipating the Dolphins looking a little bit more like last season moving forward when they were the league's number one pass rush and overall pressure rate. And also Russell Wilson against the Texans. Russ actually was kept up right pretty well on Monday night. And Mac Jones against the Steelers mentioned that quick release time. And you take TJ Watt out of the picture. Maybe this Patriots offense can finally get back on track. Shout out Carson Wentz, week high three big time throws. They are what they sound like, you know, just a really good throw. But I thought the best throw of the week, maybe not the best throw, just one of my favorite throws of the week was Justin Herbert, you know, with this freaking like 40 yard laser to Keenan Allen where the linebacker was running next to him, didn't turn his head, the safety was coming. And you just see this ball just literally Keenan just stuck his hands out. And I'm not even sure if he had to like close a grip. The ball was just so perfectly thrown. Just another in the ever growing highlight reel of Justin Herbert. On the other side of things, Derek Carr, five turnover worthy plays in week one. They were doing a good job force feeding Devontae Adams, but my goodness, Carr had a couple of nice nails throws like late in the game. Not a good performance from Derek Carr overall. Also had Joe Burrow with four turnover worthy plays, Matt Ryan with four, Justin Fields with three. So turnover worthy, remember? So even though Justin Fields and Matt Ryan had only one interception each, they were deemed to be pretty lucky to come away with just that. Highest game totals of the week, Chargers at Chiefs, 54 and a half points, Cardinals and Raiders, Vikings at Eagles at 51 and a half, Titans and Bills at 49 and a half, and the Commanders Lions at 49. On the other side of things, these are six bottom matchups in terms of just the lowest over, over-unders. Jets at Browns, 40.5 points, same with the Patriots and Steelers. The Seahawks and 49ers are 42 and a half, the Bears at Packers are 43, and the Bengals, Cowboys, as well as the Panthers and Giants games at 43 points as well. So maybe stay away from those if uh, you can at all help it and a close start sit decision takes us right into the week two quarterback rank so top tier quarterback still hasn't changed after week one josh allen patrick mahomes justin herbert jalen hurts kylo murray and lamar jackson still my top six and i'm going back to the well with trey lance like why we're, we're back in trey lance because the rushing upside we saw that fully on display in week one i'm not expecting that to go anywhere and i would like to think when he's not playing in a monsoon that we can have a little bit more passing efficiency so i will say you know we got joe burrow against the cowboys i'm <laughs> Without Dak, I see a hard time with that being a shootout. And credit to Parsons and company holding Tom Brady and the Buccaneers to just 19 points. Russell Wilson, I mean, facing the Texans, that doesn't scream shootout to me. And are they actually going to start passing the ball more? Because that was weird that they didn't in week one. And then Tom Brady's got to face his kryptonite with the Saints. So, look, I have Burrow. Russ and Brady ranked eight, nine, 10. So I'm not fading them. But if you're like, what the hell? Why is this guy still going back to Trey Lance? Like, if those guys were in better matchups, okay, I might have dipped Lance just a tad because, like, come on, man. It wasn't a great performance, even though we I've, I've mentioned Monsoon like 30 times in this podcast. But just know that some of these lower end quarterbacks, lower end QB ones that don't have the same sort of rushing upside, also dealing with some tough matchups this week. With Aaron Rodgers, need to monitor exactly who's going to be healthy or not. Last week, we were happy about the matchup before we got the late week news that both offensive tackle David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins were going to be missing this one. Also missed Alan Lazard, you know, dealing with that ankle injury. So even getting just one of these guys back could be great news in Aaron Rodgers getting back on the low end QB1 map. Right now, I do favor Rodgers just by a hair ahead of Kirk Cousins, Matthew Stafford, and Derek Carr. And yeah, I do have enough respect in the Packers pass rush to leave Justin Fields behind guys. Guys like Cousins, Stafford, Carr, and even Carson Wentz, Justin Fields as my QB 16, right where I draw the line in terms of quarterbacks where I could start them in one quarterback formats and not completely hate myself. So finally, though, four quarterbacks who had really high expected fantasy points, but weren't able to really cash in exactly on scoring the fantasy points and a lot of that has to do with them maybe not being that great at real life football, but still the opportunity was there. Trevor Lawrence was the QB three and expected fantasy points last week. Just missed a lot of throws, missed the ETM wheel, misses a Jones, Marvin Jones for potential touchdowns and big gains. Yeah. ETN did drop the one three yard pass, but it was more bad than good from Trevor Lawrence, Marcus Mariota, QB five, that sweet, sweet rushing upside. But again, let's see if the first 63 games of Mariota's career were a lie and the last two tell the future story or not. It's possible. It's possible. Joe Flacco, QB nine last week and total expected points just from freaking throwing the ball 59 times that'll happen and finally jared goff at qb 11 so washington lions maybe a sneaky shootout the people are starting to wonder so that's gonna wrap up this edition of the pff fantasy football podcast appreciate you guys tuning in as always we'll have running back wide receiver and tight end solo editions as well so if you enjoyed this check them out maybe say something nice i don't know i'm not gonna force you to 
I'm just saying. So thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Ian Hartson. Until next time, take care, everybody.